I gotta say, I'm pretty surprised by some of the prisoners on this list that there's even talks of them being released. But today, we are getting into some of the scariest prisoners up for parole in 2024, and some of them have even been released. So stay tuned for that. All right, let's get into it. We're gonna start things off with Edmund Kemper. Yes, one of America's most notorious serial killers is eligible for parole this year. This guy has been labeled a naturally born killer. Not only does he stand at six foot nine, weighing in at 250 pounds, but he also has a very high IQ. Mix that with a troubled childhood and a propensity to violence and it's quite the dangerous concoction. He took the lives of his grandparents when he was just 15. About 10 years later, he killed his mother. Between May 1972 to April 1973, he took the lives of eight women. He would lure women into his car, drive them out to secluded locations, and then smother and suffocate them. He'd then bring the bodies back to his home where he'd them. Kemper ended up receiving eight consecutive life sentences for his crimes, but again, his next parole hearing is coming up this year. Now, I mean, it's very, very unlikely that anything will come of it. He's been denied parole at every other hearing pretty much immediately, or has even chosen to waive his right to a hearing himself. Next up, we have Robert Picton, who recently became eligible for day parole and will be eligible for full parole in 2027, 25 years after his original arrest date. He hasn't had his hearing yet, but the families of his victims have already come out saying that Robert Picton has no right to walk the earth after what he did. And yeah, you know what? I cannot with the sentencing that this guy was given. He received one life sentence, one, are you kidding? He killed at least 26 women. However, he claims it was 49 and actually complained to an undercover officer that he never got his even 50. He said he was angry, furious, and disappointed with himself that he never got the full 5-0, his words. And now he's eligible for parole, like what? What happened to consecutive life sentences or life without parole? It's honestly just insane. Why are there even talks about this? If you don't know who Robert Picton is, he's a British Columbia serial killer who was active from the 90s to the early 2000s. He's often referred to as the pig farm killer because his MO included his victims before taking their lives and running their bodies through a wood chipper on his farm before feeding the remains to his pigs. I really don't understand how any judge in their right mind would or even could approve parole in this case. The crimes were just so gruesome and heinous. If anything, I feel like we should be adding time to his sentence, not taking it away. Next on the list, we have Paul Bernardo. Now, this name may not be super familiar to those outside of Canada, but this guy is one of the creepiest, most despicable criminals in Canadian history. And his latest parole hearing just happened in February. So where do I start with this guy? He's a serial killer who would also his female victims and his former wife, Carla Homoka, would often assist in his crimes. They earned the nickname the Ken and Barbie Killers, and one of their victims was Carla's very own sister. Um, I remember when I first heard about the details of this case in law class in high school, I had this uncomfortable, just weird feeling for the rest of the day, possibly even a couple days after. I had this feeling like, man, who can I trust? Could I, can I ever really know someone? It's incredibly disturbing how different these two's outward appearance and reputation was compared to the heinous things they were doing in secret until of course they were caught. Well, Bernardo has had a number of parole hearings. He insists that he's changed and that he's no longer a threat to the public, but thankfully he's been denied every time. But then again, Carla, God, she was, she was set free in 2005, so honestly, I, I wouldn't put it past them to let this guy go. Next up, we have Mark David Chapman, also known as the man who killed the Beatles, but more specifically, John Lennon, peace activist and co-songwriter, co-lead vocalist and rhythm guitarist of the Beatles. Of course, on the evening of December 8th of 1980, John Lennon was returning to his hotel when all of a sudden he heard someone shout his name. When Lennon turned around, Chapman pulled out a handheld weapon and fired four projectiles into Lennon. Two entered the left side of his back, which traveled through the left side of his chest and his left lung. One exited his body and the other became lodged in his neck. 
The other two bullets hit Lennon in his left shoulder. John made it to the hospital, but he was pronounced dead soon after. It was a terrible day in history that brought the world together in grief and mourning. John Lennon was loved and people were devastated at the loss. When Chapman was asked why he did it, he said that he wanted the world to know his name, but provided no other explanation. While he is eligible for parole, he has also been denied parole on 12 separate occasions, so I doubt he'll get it. Next on the list we have Oscar Pistorius. Oscar Pistorius is known as the Blade Runner for his achievements in track and field despite having both legs amputated as a child, competed in the 2012 Olympics in London, but just six months later he took the life of his girlfriend Riva Steenkamp. On the early morning of February 14th, 2013, Pistorius killed his girlfriend Riva Steenkamp with a firearm firing at her through a locked bathroom door in his home in Pretoria, South Africa. He claimed that he mistook her for an intruder and fired in self-defense, but the prosecution argued that it was premeditated. He ended up being convicted and with a maximum sentence of 15 years, but he was just released in January, his conditions being monitoring until his sentence expires and therapy sessions. Next we have Susan Smith, who is despicable. After killing her two sons, she was charged with life in prison, with the possibility of parole after 30 years. And guess what? It's been 30 years. On October 5th, back in 1994, Smith had called police officers to report a carjacking. Not only that, but Susan claimed that her two sons were in the car when it was stolen. Smith went on television and pleaded for their safe return. But she was full of it. Susan had killed her sons because she had secretly fallen in love with a man who didn't want children, and she believed that doing so would solve her relationship problems. When police discovered her car, it was clear that it had been deliberately rolled into a lake with her sons inside. Smith's lawyer tried to plead mental insanity, but the argument didn't stick. In response to the idea of Susan Smith being approved for parole, one of her family members was quoted saying, I don't think she's got a snowball's chance in hell. Good. So luckily this guy's uh, parole was just recently revoked, but the story is pretty insane. So in 2000, Kenneth McKay met a woman named Crystal Paskeman at a bar in Saskatoon. He offered to give her a ride home that night, but she never made it home. Instead, McKay drove her to a secluded area of her and took her life. Then he set her remains on fire behind his truck. Infuriatingly, he was granted day parole in 2023. Prison officials weren't happy about this, warning that there was a high chance he'd reoffend. And guess what happened? He started stalking a female coworker just three months after being released. Luckily, he didn't get to carry out whatever plan he had before being arrested. Next up we have Jeremy Wade Vojcovic, who just 22 years ago committed a violent crime that ended the life of a woman in Maple Ridge, British Columbia, named Colleen Findlay. Vojcovic came into contact with a woman while trespassing on her property. He beat her, bound her, and then set her and her home on fire before fleeing the scene. The court saw his actions as deliberate and methodical, and despite the fact that Vojcovic previously a day parole he received in 2022, and despite the fact that a psychiatric assessment expressed grave concern about the level of risk that he posed to the public, he's been given a 60 day unescorted absence from prison so that he may participate in a substance abuse treatment program at a residential facility in Vancouver Island. While he does have to return to the treatment facility nightly and is not allowed to consume or possess alcohol or illicit substances, it is still absolutely crazy to me that he has been allowed to leave prison at all. This next guy has to be one of the most despicable human beings alive today. Luis Gravito. This Colombian killer was nicknamed La Bestia or The Beast and the name really fits. Between 1992 to 1999, this guy took the lives of over 193 young people, very young, mostly males, and a lot of them lived on the street. It's very likely there's a much higher death toll on this guy's hands. Authorities have said it may be closer to 300. It's just never been confirmed. Not only did this evil prick take the lives of his victims, but he'd violate and torment them first. He would often pose as a priest or a monk in order to gain his victim's trust and lure them to their deaths. 
Police recovered a suitcase of his that contained journals detailing his crimes, as well as tally marks of his victims. It's incredibly sickening, and the fact that there were even discussions of this guy receiving parole recently should be a crime. He was originally sentenced to 1,853 years in prison, but Columbia law changed and maximum prison sentences were reduced to 40 years. And because Gravito assisted police in recovering the bodies of his victims, his sentence was further reduced to 22 years. He was eligible for parole just recently, but thankfully was not released. And to finish us off today, we have a man who is not up for parole, but actually received it back in 1973. And this is a perfect example of why this list is so absolutely terrifying. So in June of 1956, Richard Marquette was arrested for killing and dismembering Joan Ray Cottle. He then scattered her body parts around the city of Oregon to be discovered by police. He was given a life sentence for his crimes, but received full parole after just 12 years. 12 years, the police and the courts had found him to be polite and non-argumentative. And so even though he had taken the life of someone in a horrific fashion, Marquette was allowed to walk in 1973 after spending just 12 years in prison. Just 27 months later, in 1975, Marquette killed and dismembered 35-year-old Betty Lucille Wilson before dismembering her body and dumping her remains in a marsh. When he was arrested, he admitted that he had in fact killed two women since his release and led police to remains of the second victim. He's now serving his second life sentence in the Salem State Penitentiary and he is no longer eligible for parole. And with all of that said, I've been your host, James, and I'll catch you, yes, you specifically, in the next video.